Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, well, we're awake today. Hello. Hi, neighbors. Hi. I just love that. Hi, neighbors. Hi. Who is my neighbor? They're my neighbors. Yay. Awesome. 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 Well, good morning and welcome to Church of the Holy Spirit Son. We have a lot of new visitors here today, and I think that is awesome and exciting. Jesus. Don't worry, we don't make you stand up and identify yourself. <laughs> We've learned that psychologically that's an emotional trauma to some people when they go to church. Stand up and introduce yourself. So, but welcome, and we're so happy you're here, and we're happy you're here if you've been coming here for 17 years, or if you've been here for 30 minutes. We're so happy that you're here, and we welcome you. Amen. So today, we are going to talk about our lovely giant again, um, Goliath Must Fall. You remember we've been going through the series called Goliath Must Fall. Now, you remember the story, right? Or maybe you haven't heard it before, of Goliath. The Philistine uh, giant, nine foot tall warrior who was sent out every day for 40 days to take on one person in the Israelite army. <coughs> and for 40 days, Goliath came out and taunted and made fun of and gave him a hard time and scared them and put fear into them and said, who are you going to send to defeat me? Who are you going to send to take me on? Just send one man from your <coughs> army to fight me. Just one. Well, the Israelites, my computer's not cooperating with me. The Israelites were afraid of Goliath because Goliath was huge. And Goliath was scary. And Goliath was a champion. You see, he had won every battle he had ever engaged in. And so he had great sway over the Israelites because they were afraid. So would you pray with me? Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name. Father, we've spent the last half hour preparing ourselves to be in your presence, God. We've been singing songs to you, God. We've been hearing the spoken word. We've been praying. We've been preparing. And we're here now, God. We're here. God, we have giants in our lives. And one of the giants that we have is the giant of comfort. So today, God, I pray through your words and through this book that you have led us to go through, God, that you get us out of our comfort wherever we are stuck and move us out to conquer that giant and to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to take a technical break here. My cap locks was on. And passwords don't work when you have the cap locks on. And you can't recite scripture and type your password at the same time. It's just not possible. Comfort must fall. Are you all comfor comfortable here today? Yeah. The seats are comfy, aren't they? Yeah. The air is just right. We've been freezing. And so we asked them to turn it up a couple of notches. And I don't think anybody's <coughs> complaining that it's too cold in here anymore. And we've got um, coffee for you when you come in, right? And if you want, and fruit, and even croissants today. I saw some croissants there. So if you had a little rumbling going on in your stomach, we could have taken care of that before the long, long, boring sermon. <laughs> we do everything we can to make sure that you're comfortable here for church. But I got news for you. Nobody ever said being a Christian was comfortable. <laughs> Sorry. And if you um, have a tough time with that statement, well, you better leave now because I'm going to tell you about more of that today. In the winter of 
2012, my mom fell in her home and she hurt her hip, her leg. And she, when that happened, she was not able to take care of herself any longer. And we found out, because I'd only been going about once a year or so, I really didn't have a good assessment of where she was, but we found out that really she shouldn't have been living alone for some time before that. I don't know how long. She wasn't really able to clean her apartment. Um, after her fall, she was having difficulty bathing herself, clothing herself. And so we kind of got hit right in the face with, hello, we have an issue here that the five kids now have to take care of. So at first she went into the hospital for a little while and then she went into, she couldn't stay home alone and so she went into, um, had an aide at home for a while which my sister and brother-in-law were paying for through the generosity of their hearts. They were very generous to have an aide in her home. And then after that she went to go stay at uh, an assisted living home. It was a private home where they had um, mostly the the residents that were living there were living with Alzheimer's. And then mom, who was there because she really couldn't ambulate and take care of her daily needs. That was very difficult for her. Very, very difficult for her because she was a very social person. She didn't have anybody to socialize with. The other patients were very severe in their Alzheimer's. It was very difficult and very sad. Um, a difficult place to go and visit for sure. So mom, Sandy and I talked and I'll never forget where we were sitting on the driveway of our home in Miramar and we were talking and Sandy looked at me and she said words that I'm sure she <laughs> wondered why she ever said, do you want to bring her here? Aww. Sandy said that. Jesus, yes. I never would have expected Sandy to say that. In fact, I was afraid to say it because I didn't want to put it on Sandy to move my mom to come and live with us. I never would have said it. And she said, do you want to bring her here? And I looked at her and I said, are you sure about that? Let's pray about that. And she said, I'm sure. I know you don't like it me when I speak highly of you, so I'll stop speaking highly of you in a moment. <laughs> nah. Sandy has a servant's heart. She serves me every day. So we prayed and it seemed as though the Lord was leading us to do that. Now at the time we had only been together for three years, still a very young relationship. We were still getting to know each other. I was still learning to not tell her where to put the utensils in the dishwasher and how I wanted them. <laughs> <laughs> and since then I've learned a lot of things. <laughs> very capable of washing the dishes on her own. But when you live alone for seven years, you forget that other people know how to do those things. So we got on a conference call with my siblings and we all talked and we thought that they weren't going to agree with it because she would be moving from California and they wouldn't be able to visit her. But it turned out that it was a huge relief for them because nobody knew what to do. Nobody could or would take care of my mom but us. And that only option for that was for her to move to Florida with us. Oh my God. Did we change our comfort level? Boy, did we change our comfort level. Now to have another person living in your home is one thing, but to have your mom who you haven't lived with since 1982. <laughs> and now you're 49 and you know everything about the world and you don't need to be told anything. <laughs> Still have a twitch. <laughs> Come and live with you 
or let's put it in her perspective, to have your mother-in-law come and live with you and then start to criticize the way that you do things. Why does she do it this way? Why does she do that? Why did she close my door? <laughs> Uh, yeah. But we knew in the depths of our hearts that we had to sacrifice our comfort level to serve my mom. And I, when I was in college, I went to go visit my grandmother one time. I, we were home and we drove up the coast of California to go see my grandparents. And my grandmother was living in a nursing home, in a hospital bed, in diapers, alone. And I still cry to think about walking in there and seeing her in that condition and thinking about how lonely she must have been. My grandpa went every day to visit, but, and I promised myself at 21 years old that I would never let that happen to one of my parents. And Sandy, God used you to help make that happen. Yes. Amen. But we, we lost our comfort. We did. It's difficult to have someone else living in your home, to have your mother and your mother-in-law living in your home. But we knew that comfort in our lives must fall in order to serve mom. We had faith that God was leading us to that place. And so that's what we did. And she lived with us for just over four years. And uh, God rest her soul passed last year, February, or March, March 8th. Um, last year, and moved, uh, wrapped, moved into the loving arms wrapped around her of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Comfort must fall, guys. In our lives, comfort must fall. Now, there are some people that are in rather uncomfortable positions in life right now, and you're thinking, huh, comfort? I don't have any comfort. What are you talking about comfort? Amen? Amen. But we see in this story comfort happening and of all places in the Israelite camp in the Israelite camp and how do we see it happening in the Israelite camp the Israelites saw that monster come out every day every single day Yes, they were afraid, but yes, they, were ra they would rather stay comfortable than send one out to battle the giant. So we're going to learn today how we can be encouraged to get uncomfortable. Okay? <coughs> Anybody uncomfortable about where we're going? <laughs> Number one. Remember that faith thrives in discomfort. Faith thrives in discomfort. Oh, great. That's what I really needed to hear right now. Yeah, great. My faith isn't going to grow unless I'm uncomfortable. That's right. That's right. But it's true. If you take a look at chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, you see the faith hall of fame. Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith for us, right? Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance what we do not see. You're standing on the first step of the staircase and you can't see any of the rest of the staircase, yet you continue to go down the staircase. That's faith. Faith not only thrives in discomfort, but the gospel is rooted in a place of discomfort. How is that? Well, what's the gospel? While the, pain, while the cross brought pain to Jesus... In the very same breath, it brought freedom to us. You see, when he let that last breath out, Jesus died an excruciating death. But that last breath brought freedom to us. That's the gospel. 
That's the truth of the gospel. His death is the very reason that we can live and breathe with security. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is our story. People ask, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to put our faith in the work of Jesus Christ. It means that Jesus came to live on this earth, right? He died on the cross. He was resurrected. And he comes and he came back now not to live as a single person, human, as God, but inside of us. You see, we have the opportunity now to have Jesus with us all the time, every single day, 365, 24 hours a day, 80, 90, 100 years here on this earth, and then eternity in heaven. That, folks, is what we believe. And it all hinges around a very uncomfortable moment. But if we identify with Jesus... Here's another thing. By faith, we identify with his crucifixion. We identify with his crucifixion, right? Galatians 2.20 tells us that, right? I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Romans 6.8 tells us the same thing. Now, if we died with Christ... We believe that we will also live with him, right? That's our call. Listen, I want you guys to get this. That's our call, to die with Christ and then to live with him. In fact, let's take a survey. Okay, you ready? Name one thing in the life of faith that's completely comfortable. Resisting sin? Nope, not comfortable. Not my favorite. I'd rather eat that cookie. <laughs> Being transformed into the image of Christ, is that comfortable? Give me a thumbs down if it's comfortable, if it's not comfortable. No, not comfortable. How about joining Christ on his mission? No, not comfortable. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults, really? <laughs> I delight in hardships. I delight in persecutions. I delight in difficulties. For when I am weak, then Jesus. I am strong because he is strong. It's often when God asks us to make a big move that the bottom falls out. Louis Giglio, the author of this book, talked about how <coughs> Louis Giglio, great name, huh? You know him? Yeah, no, yeah no. cool. <laughs> Louis Giglio lived in Austin, Texas, and he and his wife, they had a thriving ministry that was happening through the passion music movement. And his parents lived in Atlanta, and they felt called to go and move to Atlanta to live there to help his mom take care of his dad. As they were preparing for the move, he had left, they had sold their house, he had let, they had, everything was done in Austin, his dad died. And now they're like, why are we going to Atlanta now? <laughs> right? The house is sold. The job is gone. Now what? And so by faith, they moved to Atlanta. And out of that faith, out of that discomfort, out of living through that, Passion Church was founded. And now thousands of people in Atlanta have the opportunity to hear the gospel because of their faithfulness. Hallelujah. Anybody in an uncomfortable bottoms drop out situation right now? Amen. Hang on, ladies. Hang on. Number two, we remember the point of our lives is not the fame of Leslie Rutland or Mike Smith or Lorenzo Robertson. The fame of our lives is about Jesus Christ. Amen. So how do we ensure that we don't lose God's opportunity by setting back in our comfort and complacency? I'm good. I got my two-bedroom, three-bathroom house, and I got a nice comfy job, and everything's good. We live two minutes from work. It's all good. Right? But what does Jesus get out of that if I stay comfortable? 
We remember the point of our lives is the fame of Jesus. Our freedom and God's glory are intertwined. So we have to remember that when we get free from that giant, that doesn't mean just stay comfortable. Anybody, have anybody got one of those recliners, electric, headrests? You know, we just bought this new furniture in our new house. And it's nice to stay there. It's comfortable, you know. But every once in a while, i got to get up off of my, and get out, and go do what God calls me to do. What does it mean to be uncomfortable? It means that we got to be willing to pay the price to take whatever step it is that God is asking us to take. I'm going to say that again. It means that we got to be willing to pay the price to take the step that God is asking us to take. God is asking you to take a step in your life right now. I'm in the middle of a big faith step right now. Big faith step. I'm in grad school. I'm 53. <clears throat> I got halfway through, and then I went, Ear. That's what God is asking me to do. You're in the middle of a big faith step right now, and I can see it on your faces. You're nodding your heads at me. Something's changing. Something's coming. <laughs> it means that we've got to be willing to pay the price for whatever step God is asking us to take. And then when we see by taking that first step that God is glorified, we realize, ho, 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 ho. It's not about me. It's about you. And we can stand there forever, right? That first step. Can't even get our leg off the ground at first, right? What's the matter with my leg? But then we finally get up the courage to take that first step. And we see that God is glorified through that step. And we realize that something bigger is happening in our lives. Right, Tim? Something bigger is happening in your life, Tim. The army of Israel was complacent in their comfort. They had their food. <coughs> they had their tents. They had a war cry. They had armor. They even had men who came and replenished their supplies. Why move? Yeah, the giant's scary, sure. But we're good here. But they weren't moving. But here's the thing, is that once David showed up, and he heard the taunts of Goliath, and he heard the threats, and he saw what was going down, he took a look at Goliath and he said, no, you're not going to continue to do this to my God, because you're dishonoring my God. You're dishonoring my Savior who's yet to come. You're dishonoring the people of God. And so Goliath said, no. I love God. I know God. I worship God. I'm not going to let you do this to God anymore. <clears throat> it's the same thing that Jesus did when he stepped out of heaven. He was willing to obey God, come to earth, be uncomfortable, live in the tension, all the while knowing that he would suffer an excruciating death. <clears throat> Can you imagine at the age that he was old enough to understand he knew that he would die. <clears throat> That's like at three years old being told that you're going to die of a terminal illness when you're 33. How would you live your life? Mm. What would you do? What faith steps would you take? How about us? <coughs> Sorry. Are we willing to serve God in this way? It's kind of scary, isn't it? But that's what we're called to do. That's where we're called to go. That's how we're called to serve. Number three, we align ourselves with God. This is another way that we can be sure that we don't fall back in our complacency. How easy is it to sit back and decide it's easier to follow the world's message? Right? 
Diane, go to school, get a job, go to school again and get a better job, go to school again and get a better, better job until you're the boss, you're in charge, and you get to tell everybody what to do, and you get a six-figure salary, and you have a nice house, and a big comfy car that drives for you, or a driver, <coughs> even better. Or, she's shaking her head, or follow what God leads you to do. Go to school and serve people in the depths of their joy or their sorrow. <coughs> Help them make decisions that could be devastating about that unborn child. And serve people that way and serve the Lord. Mm. That's the difference that I'm talking about. <coughs> we can follow the world's point of view. We can follow the example of someone else's life. We can follow and rationalize pretty much anything that we want. But the invitation isn't to come and follow our coworker. The invitation isn't to come and follow our neighbor. The invitation isn't to come and follow um, that great motivational speaker. The invitation is to come and follow Christ. <coughs> The invitation is to live a purposeful, meaningful, lasting life whose product is the walking and the following of God and the Holy Spirit. Jesus did that. He had to be about his father's business. This is what we're talking about. God doesn't call us to avoid the danger of a lost and dying world. Rather, he leads us into the world with the sword of the Spirit in our hands. Amen? Amen? to go ahead and take on any giant that is coming our way. John 9, 4 says, We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. Life is short, guys. We have to take that sword of the Spirit by the hand and walk through life and work through life the way God calls us to. It's going to be uncomfortable. If you're an authentic Christian, you're living your life that way, life isn't always comfortable. In fact, life can be downright uncomfortable. But remember that as you follow him and you serve him and you align yourself with him, your life honors him. Your life glorifies him. Amen. Your life is abundance in him. Amen. Now, I have a friend here today. We've already heard him speak who's lived much of his life, a lot of his life, uncomfortable. But he's decided to not be comfortable so that others can thrive, so that others' lives can be saved, so that others can live their lives in abundance. And I want to introduce to you now again my friend Lorenzo. You. Um, what I'm going to do now is it's called um, I Ain't Mad at God. I know that's not gra grammatically correct, but I ain't mad at God. <laughs> God created me to be a caring, compassionate, and loving person. And I strive to be that person that he created me to be every day on his earth. Some years ago, I was dealt a devastating blow that changed my life and the way that I lived my life. That life-altering blow was an AIDS diagnosis. That day, that literally changed the way I viewed this precious life that I've been granted to live. From that day, I have asked the Lord to keep me in his arms of protection, but never once have I asked or questioned, why me? Instead, I asked, why not me? Obviously, God knew that I could handle the pressures and challenges that ultimately would be ahead for me and my family and my friends. With prayers and support from people that love and care about me, I've embarked upon this tedious journey as a person living with AIDS. I've opted to flip the script though because and not pretend that I'm living with AIDS, AIDS is living with me. 
I know that I'm living with AIDS, but I have decided that I'm not going to allow AIDS to dictate how I live my life and how I want to do it. AIDS was a AIDS is a dev devastating disease, and many people are afraid to even utter the word AIDS. I'm not one of those people. I've even taken it one step further. I work in the field as well. You know that one thing that I've learned about people, especially my black people and religious people? Um, most of them are afraid to say the word AIDS. <coughs> what I also have what I also try not to do is to desensitize AIDS, to really make it un uncomfortable for people. Um, what I do is to make sure that we don't sweep it under the rug and never speak about it again, especially in Nick's company, and that's anybody outside of the family. However, through it all, I've learned that the more and more I've learned to lean on the everlasting and strong arms of the Lord. Yes. He has helped me when there was no one there to hold me. He has comforted me in those lowest hours when I just didn't feel like I wanted to go on living with li living this life with AIDS any longer. The Lord has kept me without any opportunistic infections for many, many years, so that I know that the Lord, he has a song for me to sing. However, he hasn't given me a voice to sing it yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he also has a sermon for me to preach. Okay. But um, I don't know if he, he had maybe been calling me, but maybe I haven't been listening properly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's, um, there are some things that I need to do that he has left me here for. And I, something that he wants me to do that I may have done yet. So I will continue to pray and ask the Lord to keep me in his loving arms, his loving, strong, and caring arms of protection to protect me from the enemy. See, I am mad at God for all the things he has allowed to happen in my life. I am grateful, I am grateful that I'm still here to praise the Lord one more time yeah. and to be allowed to glorify his name to the highest. He has kept me here for a purpose. And for that, I am mad at God. Amen. Amen. to be uncomfortable. Learn how to live in the tension like Jesus did between life and the cross. Learn how to live in that place. Neighbors, learn how to be uncomfortable and hold on to the hem of Jesus' garment Amen. because it's going to be a wild ride, guys. Amen. But if you do it and you do it the way he calls you to do it. He gets the glory, not you. Amen. Your faith is made stronger, and you align yourself with God. Hallelujah. So as we get ready to close, I want to pray over you. So please bow your heads. Father, we are uncomfortable. We are in places and areas in our lives, God, where we don't know what's going to happen next. And God, we're holding on to stuff to try to keep ourselves steady. But Father, right now, God, you are calling us to let go of that stuff and those people and those things so that we can hold on to you with both of our hands as strong as possible. So God, let us just make that switch right now from what we're holding on to, that we move from holding on to the job, we move from holding on to the person, we move from holding on to the drugs or the alcohol or whatever addiction it is, and we let go and grab on to you, God, because we know that you will not let us fall, that you will always hold us, God. And that we can always find shelter up under the shadow of your wing, God. So as we now hold on to you, God, I pray that you strengthen our faith, Father. Lord, teach us your way. 
through your word, God. Show us the direction that you would have us head, God. And let us, God, be honest with each other and be transparent with each other, Father, so that we can pray for each other and stand in the gap for each other, God. God, I pray that you give us great faith today as we head out of this place, God, that you have given us a word, Father, where we can be encouraged, God, that yes, sometimes life just really stinks, but you know, and you love us, and you care for us, and you want to show us the way to live our lives for you, God, to glorify you, God, to align ourselves with you, God, to show people, God, that through our weakness, you are glorified, Lord, so that through our lives, other people can get to know you, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.